we know that our enemy is uh, very much at hand, very much ready to uh, tie into us, to make us see things different than what they really are. And we pray that as we study this morning, we can give you honor and glory, that each statement made would be to your honor and your glory, and it would be very clear and plain so that each one of us can take this home, share it with others, for we pray in our Savior's name. Amen. <coughs> My topic has been, what is Satan doing about the mystery? And uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, a verse that when we get there, uh, you're going to know it uh, because you've already heard it. But we want to look at some things in here. And then also in Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll get to that later on. And they are very familiar uh, verses to, for you. So uh, let's look in Ephesians 4 and verse 14. And my Bible is getting so worn that the pages have a, are all frayed and everything and dog-eared and corners missing and everything else. So you'll probably get there before I do. Ephesians 4 verse 14, That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now I know I'm limited on time here, so the things, one of the things that we can learn about Satan, and a thing to, to help gain some of that time, is to look at some of the names given to him throughout the scriptures. And I wrote some of them down. Uh, we're not going to look those verses up. I'm going to give you the reference where you might be able to uh, go home and look them up. And uh, if you want to be able to prove everything you're saying from the Word of God, you've got to have the verses there. And if we're going to stand on this King James issue like we do, you either quote the Bible word for word or read it word for word. Look at every word and how every word ends because it's extremely important that you do that. Because if you can change one letter in one word in a verse, it changes the whole meaning. In the beginning, God created the what? Heaven. What's all of the perversions got in them? Right. One letter. All right. He's called... In Genesis chapter 3, 1, the serpent. In Matthew 4, 3, the tempter. Now you write fast because uh, I'm going to go through these rather quickly. Uh, in John, 4, John 8, 44, the Lord calls him a murderer and a liar. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 9, and also in chapter tw or, uh, 9, 12, verse 9, and 20, verse 2, He's called the great dragon, the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. The great dragon, old serpent, the devil, and Satan. Now, Satan is referred to 53 times throughout the scriptures. And you're going to have to go through this one in the order in which I give you the verses. He's find out who Baal is, Exodus 32, 4 through 24. Exodus 32, 4 through 24, Ezekiel 28, 14, then go backwards to Ezekiel 1, verse 10, and 10, verse 14. That way you can prove who uh, Baal is and who that uh, individual of Satan has turned out to be. He's the anointed cherub that covered and... Uh, they made that golden calf that supposedly jumped out of the fire, and you know the story. He's also called Belial in 1 Samuel 2, verse 12. And Belial is, a, is the name given to the sons of Eli. They were Hophni and Phinehas, and you remember them, and they, uh, they, they were uh, wicked individuals, and they did everything but what they were supposed to. Well, Belial means wickedness, worthlessness, and hopelessness. Now, isn't that a name to be associated with? Belial in 1 Samuel 2, verse 12, wickedness, worthlessness, and hopelessness. 
Now we've got an idea of what this character Satan is up to. Let's look at some statements about that individual. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 3. Like I said, my Bible is getting so dog-eared. Uh, Ed gave me a new one last night, and uh, it worked pretty good. Other than everything's on the wrong side of the page. <laughs> Ezekiel 28 and verse 3. Now, if you look in verse 1, he, he's talking about the prince of Tyrus. Now, a prince is a governor, and a king is over a prince. So he says this prince, he says in verse 3, and it gives us an idea of when this book was written, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. So Satan was, is, is the one that's a king over the prince here. And when you get down to verse 12, it will tell you that uh, son of man take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Now, son of man in Ezekiel refers to Ezekiel, and it's exactly 100 times. Whenever you find the son of man somewhere else, it always refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, keep that in mind, because when you see son of man in uh, the book of Ezekiel, and you go to the first chapter, in the, and, or the second chapter in the first verse, you'll find that. It always refers to Ezekiel himself. So now we have... This individual who thinks he's wiser than Daniel. So if Ezekiel was captive in Babylon at the same time Daniel was, what had already happened to Daniel? He had had that, well, yes, they were captive, and, but he had had that dream of Nebuchadnezzar brought to him, and he had explained all the details about that. And Daniel was the only one that could do that. He says, I'm wiser than Daniel. You going to argue with him and win? Uh, turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. A very familiar passage. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. How would you like to have that said about you? more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So how does he go about? He's very subtle. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. There's nothing good ever said about him. Now, what's he going to say about the uh, body of Christ? Well, some of his actions that have been described... We've seen in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, he was a subtle individual. Again, he suggests in Genesis 3 verse 1. In Revelation 12 verse 7, he's a fighter because there's war in heaven and he leads the thing. He tempts the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4 and also in Luke, and you can go back to those uh, references yourself. He's an accuser. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. So now let's look at what the Apostle Paul says about him. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. And look at that verse. And uh, they tell me that one thing a, a person, ha a speaker has an advantage of here is when he's uh, the last one of the morning because there's no speaker after him and he can take some more time. <laughs> well, when I hear somebody's stomach get past the growling stage and starts barking, I'll quit. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. We want to look at this verse with every word that's in it. And we don't want to leave one out and we don't want to miss one. That we henceforth Henceforth means from this point forward. 
Was I on that thing or not? No, guess not. From this point forward, we henceforth be no more children. Now, why does he say children? You can talk a little child into about anything, can't you? You can talk them into believing about the most far-fetched thing you ever heard. Uh, and I've got to tell you this. Uh, Alan was telling me the other day. I thought he was over here while I go. There he is. There's, he got four boys, and the third one's be seven next week. He was laying out in the yard. And, uh, we're farmers. And uh, he was looking up in the sky, and Alan said, What are you doing out there, Colin? I'm playing dead. <laughs> well, what are you playing dead for? I'm going to catch one of them buzzards up there in the sky when he comes down. <laughs> he did that. <laughs> now, they, they can uh, think of a lot of things. But we, from this point forward, be no more children tossed to and fro. We're not to be tossed to and fro from one thing to another to another to another. And carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now, what's the wind? Well, that's the movement of the air. It can be a breeze or anything from there up to a tornado or a hurricane. So he says, we're not, from this point forward, we're not going to be carried about by a child, like a child, by every breathe, uh, uh, breeze or tornado that comes along. Wind of doctrine. What's doctrine? That's another word for teaching. So you've got teachers out there that are teaching things that are as far-fetched as you can get. Where do they get that information? Well, I thank Leroy a while ago because he taught some of the things that I was going to, and I don't have to teach it now. I can go ahead with something else. <laughs> By the slight of men. Okay, now we've got these doctrines. We've got these things that are taught by the slight of men. You ever watch a magician? Or they think they're magicians? What do they do? They move something around with one hand while they actually do something with the other one, kind of like a pickpocket and all that stuff. <laughs> but then they make you think that they perform something extraordinary, don't they? That's exactly how some of these guys are teaching. And who's behind all those kind of teachings? Well, let's go on. And cunning craftiness. Ooh. Cunning craftiness. Did you ever, did you ever see a fox and watch one of them? Of course, we're out there in the country. We can see them and, and you watch them and, and so on and so forth. Try to slip up on one. You can't do it. They're sly enough and cunning enough and uh, such that you're not going to catch one of them unless you bait him in a trap. It's just like the old farmer, his, him and his wife went out to the chicken house and foxes like to catch chickens in a chicken house. Uh, well, not many of us got chickens anymore, but uh, anyhow, the smoke was rolling out of his double barrel shotgun and uh, the wife said, well, you missed the fox, but you got all the hens. <laughs> and the fox was going off with one out the back where he blowed a hole in the wall. That's exactly what's going to happen to Satan. He's going to get caught one of these days. Okay, he's and by cunning craftiness. What's craftiness? What, what, what's a craft? A craftiness. Ness, ness, ness. I'm, from, I'm a farmer. So I don't care how... I thought I was doing real good in English till I found out what that letter stood for. <laughs> Anyhow, cunning craftiness. That's how these people are teaching with these other doctrines. And 
They're giving them wrong, and they're saying it's in the Bible, and they get all carried away, and some of those things they do, and they get to slobbering and drooling at the mouth because they're going so long, and they spits on the floor and everything else, and they slip and they spit and they fall. And then they holler, hallelujah, praise the Lord, as they're trying to get up. <laughs> well, notice what they do, whereby they lie in deceit. They wait in deceit. That should give you, that one word should tell you who's behind all of this. Who's behind all these things? With all these doctrines, tossing you to and fro, and carrying you around like a child. Well, it's none other than Satan. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. And I pondered over these uh, uh, 2 Corinthians. I pondered over some of these verses in what order to put them in, and maybe I should have put this one first before I did the last one, but I didn't. He says in Second uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. What are some of his divided devices? What are some of the things that he uses? What are some of these things that he lies in wait to deceive? We already talked about the King James Version. You talk about versions, how many do you want? If that's not enough, we got some more. Those are all available today. There's 20 of them here in this little advertisement thing. Bible translations compared. You know, that's almost one for every day of the month. And the ones that aren't here, there's, there's another ten. There is one for every day of the month. No two of them say the same thing. No two of them say the same. Which one are you going to believe? But do you know you can take all those denominations, or all those uh, translations, and they come from the same pl uh, source, and I don't think I brought it up here, but it comes from Westcott and Hart. Uh, Want to get my Bible case right behind you there? And uh, there should be, and pass that thing up. I, I've got something I want to read to you. Thank you. One of the best ways to find out what a person believed and what he taught and what he really was was to look at some of the things that he wrote. And West Cotton Hart did write back and forth to each other. Now, I must tell you this. They lived at about the same time the Civil War was going on in this country. And they're the ones that wrote this wonderful Greek stuff that is so accurate today. <laughs> and it's more accurate than any translation out there. So here's what they say. Uh, Westcott, in 1847, writes this, I never read an account of a miracle, but I seem instinctively to feel its improbability and discover some want of evidence in the account of it. Didn't believe in miracles in the Scriptures. Did not believe in the infallibility of the Scriptures. Westcott wrote to Hort in 1860, I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. Hort wrote back to him, if you make a decided conviction of the absolute infallibility of the New Testament, I fear I could not join you, even if you were willing to forget your fears about the origin of the Gospels. Westcott and Hort were clearly anti-Protestant. Hort says, I think I mentioned to you before Campbell's book on atonement, which is invaluable as far as it goes. But unluckily... He knew nothing except Protestant theology. These are things that they wrote. Uh, there's one other one here I want to, oh, they believed in the worship of Mary. 
now what were they? Why does their account in the Greek agree with all Catholic doctrine? I am very, uh, Hort writes, I am very far from pretending to understand completely the ever-renewed validity or vitality of Mariolatry. I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common in their causes and their results. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now see why you've got all these translations. Now can you see why we have all these things? So being carried about by every wind of doctrine, every teaching that comes along. Well, if we don't use all those Bibles, you know what the most disastrous thing has been for the cause of Christ? Denominations. Denominations. Well, just come and take your pick, kind of like a, a guy in the carnival. Come and take your pick. There's some more of those. We got... Uh, Anabaptist, Congregational Churches, Baptist uh, Churches, Churches of Christ, Adventist, Pentecostal Churches, uh, and that's just a start. Now we're just getting wound up here. Catholics, Orthodox, Lutheran, Anglican Churches, uh, Presbyterian, Methodist, and then there's us. What about all these things? Where do they all come from? What about all these winds of doctrine? Paul tells us don't be carried about and tossed to and fro from this point on with every wind of doctrine that comes along. All those teachings that come along are nothing but a mess. We talk about denominations. How did the denomination start? There was usually one or two or three guys that got together, and they decided that here's what the Scripture's teaching. Now, if you agree with me, you can be part of our denomination. And if you don't, there's the door and doom, out you go. I know. Rodney knows because I was in the same boat that he was in. And it sunk, didn't it? Do they teach the Word of God rightly divided? They teach, uh, you notice I said, do they teach the Word of God? Do they teach the Word of God? Yeah. But it's wrongly divided. And it's kind of like the guy that, he, he was uh, uh, one that believed that uh, he should close the Bible and open the page and stick his finger on it. And, and that's what God would give. God's telling me to do something. He opened the Bible, put his finger on a uh, verse, and it said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. <laughs> Boy, what's that got to do with me? So he closed the Bible, opened again, stuck his finger down, go down and do likewise. <laughs> Got rid of one more uh, wrong divider. These are Satan's tools. You can just look at what that verse says, and we won't, we've got about uh, eight verses yet to go. I hope you had a late breakfast. <laughs> In Galatians 1, 8, and 9, Paul gives us a pretty stern warning. As a matter of fact, it's the most stern warning I've ever, he, he gives. Galatians 1, 8, and 9. Now remember, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And we want to be sure that we understand from his names and from his actions and from the descriptions given that we've looked at in the scriptures or given you that you can go home and look at them again and I hope in your own time you're studying the scriptures. But in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8 and 9, he says, but though we are... Now God inspired him to write these verses down. But though we are an angel from heaven. Now why did he include an angel from heaven? How does Satan go about? As an angel of what? Light. Yeah. So 
all these people that come to you and said, I had a vision and this angel told me something, it might have been. But it wasn't an angel from God because God doesn't use angels for the body of Christ today. It was an angel of light from Satan. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Strong language, isn't it? He repeats it. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. How many messages did Paul preach? One. There's a group that claims that he preached two. The kingdom gospel and then the gospel of the grace of God. That's not what the verse says. And that's what we go by, what the verse says. I'm not going to go back to a Roman Catholic uh, who wrote some Greek uh, to, and determine from his writings what that verse says. I'm going to look at what that verse says because that's written in a language that I understand and I know what English is and that's the only language I've ever learned. Uh, one of my grandpas, uh, my great-grandpa came from Germany on my mother's side and my grandpa could speak uh, two languages. He was bilingual and you would never know that he uh, speak, spoken, speaking one you'd never know he'd speak the other one because he didn't have a, an accent or anything in either one of them. But he didn't teach us anything. <laughs> and you, you can see that. <laughs> okay. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 7. How much time? 1 Corinthians 2, Verses 6 and 7. And we want to see some things here that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, again, inspired by God. It's an important passage. Let's read verse 6, 7, and 8. Uh, Leroy read part of these a while ago, but I'm going to read them again. Howbeit we speak wisdom to them that are perfect. To them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Who's the king over those kind of princes? None other than Satan. If he had known that Jesus Christ's blood was going to pay for all of our sins, and we're going to replace those angels in heaven that fell. Would he have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? No. No, not at all. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. Why does Paul warn us about an angel from heaven? You've already known this verse. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. To an, what's Jesus Christ called in, in the Gospel of John? The light of the world, isn't he? Who wanted to be the light of the world? Satan did. He wanted to replace him. Well, it's amazing how God has given man a free choice and he's still getting everything done that he wants to do. Now let's, let's leave that uh, chapter 4 in Ephesians verse 14. And let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. I was given verses 11 through 16. If we, I'm going to start with verse 10. Uh, because I noticed nobody else had that verse. And I don't like to take a verse that they've been assigned and use it in something I'm presenting, so I don't find that in anybody else's. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now look at every word and how every word ends. Don't leave a word out. Don't miss them. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 now and verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Now it's interesting to note that in verse 11 he talks about the whole armor of God. Do you leave out one piece? What's he say? 
put on the whole armor of God. Skip a verse and look at the next verse. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. So you put it all on. You put every piece of that armor on. What is that armor? Well, let's look at what else he says before we get to the armor. Put on the, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, we've already seen he's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He loves to, well, there's nothing good about him, and he loves to deceive people. He deceives them in believing what he wants them to believe instead of what God says in his word. Okay, so the wiles of the devil, there's nothing good about him. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The battle really isn't against that person that's preaching that message. It's the one that's uh, teaching him that message. But against principalities, isn't that a government, form of government? Against powers, doesn't governments have powers? against the rulers of the darkness of this age, this world? Don't rulers have power and authority? Against spiritual wickedness in high places? Oh, there's where we hit it. It's spiritual wickedness. So how would Satan approach an individual? Oh, this is thing, something you want. This is spiritual. You ever hear of an evil spirit? What kind of a spiritual things do Satan present to you? Evil spirits. And it's evil teaching. Did you realize that wrong division is an evil? Look at that verse again. Against, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this, age, of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, what's Satan's devices? Paul says we're not ignorant of them. They're evil spiritual devices. Then he says, wherefore, once again, he reminds us, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. So it must be important to take on that whole armor of God because he says it twice, almost in the same breath, hasn't he? What are we going to do, just throw it out the window? Dad used to say, throw it out the window. <laughs> no. We need to understand what the scriptures say and then do them. That you may, why? Why does he tell us that we need to take on the whole armor of God? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I pondered over that evil day for years, probably 20, 25 years. And I know there's some that try to associate this with something that you find in Amos chapter 6, in the second verse. It talks about the same thing, the evil day. But was there not an evil day in Noah's time? Was there not an evil day in Moses' time? Was there not one in Adam's time? Was there not one when Christ was on the earth? Is there not an evil day today or going to be? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, I know you folks over on this side cannot see this. Probably those on... Uh, Electronic means can't see it either. But this yellow part here is the age in which we live today. Now, we are somewhere between here and here. We don't know just where. Why has this dispensation taken so long? It's covered over a period of more than 2,000 years. Now, Ray Watson isn't with us anymore. He's already... His eternity has started. And I miss him. 
we went out for ice cream last night, some of us. And always before, Ray was with us. And he had us laughing the whole time we was over there. And uh, he wasn't there last night. But he, he made a statement that I totally agree with and I'll probably never forget. He says there's a lot of people that think they're going to heaven and they're not. They won't be there. Why has this dispensation taken so long? Why has it been almost the longest dispensation of all in the scriptures? Time passed, but now in ages to come. Look what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. He says, this is inspired of God for Paul to write this down. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. The latter times of what? The Scriptures? The Kingdom? The Age of Grace? The latter times? Now, we have that same word used in the Revelation. It talks about a time, times, and half a time. What does time refer to there? Well, one year. Times refers to two years, and a half a time is a half a year. That's three and a half years. But we know that the latter times is dealing with years. I'm not going to say it's two years, but it's the latter times of this age in which we live. Notice what he says. Some shall de- Now, Paul expected this to occur when? In his own lifetime, right. He says, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So he thought that these things was going to be a short period of time. It's all going to take place and it'd be over and then God would go ahead with that kingdom program. With the ages to come. But now let's look what he says. He says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. What's the faith there? That's the very thing that we're talking to you about, this truth. That's right division. That's God's plan of salvation through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, eternal salvation and eternal hope in the heavens with Christ. That's this dispensation. They're going to depart from that. Now, if somebody was up here and they talked about the east and pointed that way. You know what way that is? That's west. <laughs> uh, I went to the Philippines one time and with uh, Dan Gross, and uh, he said he couldn't understand how I always knew what direction we were going. Well, when you're out in the country, you always know what direction you are. That's up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's north, and that, that's west. If I depart from going west, what do I do? I go east, don't I? If you depart from the faith, what do you go to? A lie. You see what's happening? What's going to happen? Has it happened? Is it happening? How long has it been? Since Paul's day, well. But it's in Paul's day, stop and think about what he had against, going against. He was the only one on the whole face of the earth that knew about this message that we hold so dear. There were seven other men, seven other men, that he called, that God called apostles to confirm what Paul was preaching. Timothy was one of them. Titus was one. <clears throat> Several others. So they're departing from the very truth that we know what's there. And what do they give heed to? Lies, seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. What was it that Paul said that we needed to watch for? Who, who's the enemy? It's Satan himself. 
speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats. How do you forbid somebody to marry and command them not to eat meats? What do you do? How, how, do, you, how do you get that job done? You make a law, don't you? Somebody, you said a law. Yeah. We don't have that yet. But you know, it's coming. It says so. And we've got a move in this country, a movement now, that you shouldn't eat anything but vegetables. Don't eat any animals. What's it say in the next breath? Which God has created to re receive with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now we said that in the latter times, uh, dealt with years over here. Now look at what, how 2 Timothy chapter 3 starts out. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. In the last what? Days. Perilous times is going to come. The last days. That would be the last part of the what? That would be the last part of the, or the last days would be the last part of what he's talking about in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1 in the last latter times. So let's see what happens then. I charge thee therefore, or that's the wrong one, verse 3, or verse 1 of chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Don't see any of that happening, do you? It's been happening all the time. All, but there's one thing in here that really puts the finger on the last days. Look at verse 12. Now, verse 12 is in the same chapter that verse 1 is. Isn't that amazing? Yea, and what's that little three-letter word? That will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, notice that it says that all will live. Does that mean that you have to go out and preach right division? It says if they all live godly in Christ Jesus. What was it we, we read back there in 1 Timothy 4? They're going to forbid you from eating meat. So if... You eat meat, you're going to suffer persecution. Have you looked up what Paul said persecution was? I've got two minutes left. All members of the body of Christ that's going to be obedient to the teaching of the word of Christ in those last days are going to suffer persecution. They're going to go through the same things that began with the apostle Paul. Why? Why? Satan knows that his time is about to run out. Now, there's a certain number. God is so meticulous in everything. There's a certain number that fell in heaven of those angels, and those are going to be replaced. And Satan knows how many angels there were that fell because they were his. Now, he does not know how many members of the body of Christ there are. But after so long a time, he's going to know that it's getting close. So what's he going to do? The same thing he did with the first, started out with, with the Apostle Paul. What all happened to him? He was put in jail. He was beaten. He was persecuted, wasn't he? What did Paul do before, when he thought he was doing the right thing for the Lord Jesus Christ? He even killed people. The end of this age is not going to be a glorious time. When, there's, when, when that last person is saved, how many people is going to be preaching to him? Probably one. And I know when I, when I first began to hear about the, 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 what we call the rapture, we had pictures drawn of buses crashing, trains running off the track, airplanes coming down, and cars running into each other because there was going to be millions of people in that rapture. 
and taken out and going down, while it's going down the road and so on and so forth. How many people was left when God caused a flood on the earth? Eight. God's patient, isn't he? This thing's going to get bad, and then it's going to get worse. We're going to find out who it is that's really standing for the Lord Jesus Christ if it happens in our day. Now, last year, I've got 20 seconds. Where did this thing turn off? Uh, last year, I mentioned to you that uh, they'd done a census, and there was less than 1% of the people of the United States that produce the food. Hi, now I got another 50 minutes. <laughs> There's less than 1% of the people of the United States that produce the food for the rest of you. Now, how many of you here today make your living producing food uh, totally? There's three of us, four of us. Alan's over here, five, six. <laughs> you know, we just got a, a, a new census back, and the Secretary of Agriculture corrected that statement. There's less than one-tenth of one percent producing the food for everybody else, the actual producer. We have a far greater number of food producers in this room than they have outside or on the east side of us. What percentage God called, or when the Lord was on the earth, he told the 12 that they were the salt of the earth, didn't he? If you have a great big old cast iron kettle, uh, let's see, a 30-gallon one. Some of you never saw one of them, have you? <laughs> like you used to render lard or cook the lard down and the fat and so forth and then render it all out. And that's another statement there, rendering. Uh, you know what you do when you render lard? You heat that all up and then you squeeze it out through there and you make it come out something else? That's what these guys do with the scriptures. This would have been better rendered this. It would. <laughs> okay. But as we see those things done, we see them changing the Word of God. We see it being rendered. We see Satan's tools at hand. And we see that we've got a far greater number of farmers right here today than outside these walls in this country. How many are there today that's preaching the word of faith, the word of truth? What's the percentage? I mean, the real percentage. Who is it that's really teaching the word rightly divided? Some of them, as we always said, are claiming to be grace, and they're not. How many are really teaching the Word of God? Are you ignorant of Satan's devices? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray that as we've looked at these passages, we might have gained something from your Word, and that we can honor and glorify you in all things for the future hope that we have and for the hope of many that might continue to be saved. In our Savior's name we ask, amen.